All right, so let's take a look at unit two review. So, all right, number one, the zeros for f of x are, all right, now you could do this one of two ways. We could do it algebraically, or we could do it in the calculator. We could do it graphically. So let me start with algebraically. So algebraically, if we want to find the zeros, all that means is that we want to just take our function and set it equal to zero. We're figuring out what values of x make this right here equal to zero. Oh, wait, look, I'm missing the x. That would have thrown me off. Let me slide that in there. Okay, so now, in order to solve this, we're going to factor. Now, if you look at all of your terms, you want to first say, can I factor out the greatest common factor? Well, now that that x is in there, look at that. Yes, you can. You can pull an x out of each of these terms. So I'm going to start off by pulling out an x which would leave me with basically all of my terms having the exponent one lower than what it originally was, right? So this x to the fourth, we pull the x out, becomes x cubed. This 4x cubed, we pull the x out, becomes 4x squared. Okay, and just bring down your sign. So I'm gonna bring down the minus sign, and then 9x, bring down the plus sign, and then 36. I can close my parentheses and write equals zero. Okay, now within the parentheses, we have four terms right here. So if we have four terms, right, what we want to do is we want to do factor by grouping. Now, this x, don't forget about it, it keeps coming down. And we want to open a parenthesis before we do factor by grouping. Now, if the parentheses mess you up, you can always use a square bracket. Like, if you prefer, here, let me actually do that. You can erase this, right? We could use a square bracket just to separate it. Bracket means the same thing as parentheses. Okay, so here... You want to look at your first two terms and you want to say, oh, look, I could take out an x squared. And when I do, that'll leave me with x minus 4 in parentheses. And out of the next two terms, I can pull out a 9. But because this first term is a negative, right, we always pull out the sign of the first term, we're going to pull out a negative 9, which would leave me with x and then minus 4, right? 36 divided by negative 9 is negative 4. So now I'm going to close my bracket. Okay, see that? I know normally we use parentheses, but if it's easier to, for you to use brackets, that way you could decipher between the parentheses, you know, definitely do so. All right, so I'm going to take this x and bring it down. And then I'm going to take what's, see how these both say x minus 4? I'm going to take what's in front of them, so the x squared minus 9, and I'm going to put them together within a parenthesis. Right, that's going to be our first parenthesis. And then I'm going to take this common parenthesis and write it once and once only. All right, I'm kind of running out of room, so I think, and let me bring down the equals there. I think I'm just going to keep working my way down. All right, now we're not done factoring because doesn't x squared minus 9 factor further, right? We want to factor it using dots. So let me bring my x down. Since x squared minus 9, right, we, we learned about factoring in unit 1, is dots, that would factor to x plus 3, and x minus 3. And then let me take my x minus 4 and bring it down. And this equals 0 and bring it down. Now in unit 1, when it said to factor, these would be your factors, right? You would just factor and stop. But here we're finding the zeros. We want to solve for what values of x make this equation true. So this is where we take it an extra step and we make our t-chart. Right, so we wind up with x equals 0 x equals negative 3, x equals positive 3, and x equals 4. All right, so 0 plus and minus 3 and 4. Look at that, choice 1. Now, I'm also going to show you how to do this graphically. Okay, so what I did was I went to y equals and I plugged this into my calculator. I know you can't see the whole thing. And then I'm just going to hit graph. So the zeros are where the graph intersects the x-axis. So it looks like we're intersecting the x-axis right here at negative 3. It's hard to see this one, but if you look, the graph actually is coming down. It's going back up, down, and up. So there actually is a point where it intersects right here. You can kind of see the graph here and here. If you have a calculator that's color-coded, you'll definitely see that. But it's intersecting at 0 at positive 3 and positive 4. And you know what? If that's hard to see graphically, you could always hit second graph and just go to the table of values, right? You're going to scroll. I'm going to scroll up a little. You want to see where is our um, where are the y values equal to 0 because isn't that where the graph intersects the x-axis? So look at negative 3. We have 0. At 0, 
the y value is zero. And then if I scroll back down, I saw them before, at three and at four. Okay, so zero, positive and negative three, and four. Okay, number two. So a sketch of r of x is shown below. They wanna know which of these could represent an equation for r of x. And notice these are in factored form. All right, so the zeros are where the graph intersects the x-axis. Okay, so these are the zeros. The zeros are at negative c, negative b, and positive a. These are also called roots as well, or solutions, but the factors are gonna have the opposite signs. So we're looking for x plus c, x plus b, and x minus a. Okay, so it's either gotta be choice one or choice four. Now remember, see right here how the graph doesn't cut through the x-axis, it comes down to it and then bounces back up in the positive direction. This, when the graph bounces off the x-axis, we say it has multiplicity. So that would have two factors at that point. So the x plus c is gonna have a square on it, like we see right here in choice four. Okay, so number three, which binomial is a factor of that expression? All right, so let's try to factor it. So since there's four terms, we're gonna jump into grouping. So out of the first two terms, we could pull out an x squared. We're just gonna leave us with x squared minus four. And out of the next two terms, we could pull out a four, but because this first term is a negative, we're gonna pull out a negative four. Ugh, and when we do, that leaves us with x minus two. Okay, these right here have to match and they don't. These are not equal. So what that means is, we cannot factor this using the grouping method. So we need to come up with another plan. All right, well think about what we saw in the last example. If we know where the graph crosses through or intersects the x-axis, so basically if we know the zeros of the graph, can't we reverse the signs to find the factors? Okay, so let's do it. Let's plug this into y equals in our calculator. All right, so I went to y equals and I plugged this in. And if I hit graph, we might be better off going to the table of values. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do that because to me, these are a little unclear, they're a little hard to see. So let me hit second graph, and I'm looking for where the y is equal to zero, which we could see, see right here? Y is zero when x is two. So if we have a zero or a root or a solution at x equals two, wouldn't the factor have to have the opposite sign? Wouldn't the factor have to be x minus 2. Okay, so choice 1 would be the answer. Okay, number 4. Evan graphed a cubic function, okay, that's a third degree function, and determined the roots to be negative 1, positive 1, and positive 2. Okay, that being said, what is the value of b if a equals 1? All right, so if we know that the roots are at negative 1, positive 1, and positive 2, doesn't that mean our factors would have to be at x plus 1, x minus 1, and then x minus 2, right? So basically, by giving us the roots or the zeros of the solutions, that leads us to our factors. Now, they do say that the value of a is 1, so that means the leading coefficient is 1. So why don't we write f of x equals, and I'm just going to put a 1 in front of there. Now, technically, the 1 doesn't matter, okay? What I want to do is I want to multiply all of these out and rewrite it in standard form like that so we can see what b is equal to. Okay, so I guess I'll multiply together the first two parentheses first. So that'll give me x squared minus x plus x minus 1. Okay, and I'm just going to bring down the x minus 2. Actually, this is a pretty easy one because look, the negative x and the positive x just cancel, right? Boom, boom. So that's going to leave us with f of x being equal to x squared minus 1 times x minus 2. All right, let's keep going. So now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the answer of the product of these first two parentheses by x minus 2. So we're just going to double distribute again x squared times x is x cubed. x squared times negative 2 is negative 2x squared. 
negative 1 times x would just be negative x, and negative 1 times negative 2 would be positive 2. Okay, so they wrote it in this format. So a is the number in front of the x cubed, which is 1, which is what they told us. b would be the number in front of the x squared, which is negative 2. And that's what they're looking for. What is the value of b? So the value of b is choice 4. It's negative 2. If they wanted c, we could see it would have been negative 1. And if they had asked for d, we would see it would be positive 2. So it was kind of a tricky one. Okay, number 5. Which description could represent the graph of this function right here if a is an integer? Okay, so a is just some number. Now, this is kind of, there's a couple different ways we can go about this. If you think about this kind of logically, right, with what we know about math, see this first term. Like if we had multiplied this out, right, this would give us 4x cubed, right? So if we had, if our leading coefficient was a 4x cubed, so we have a third degree function, a third degree function. I'm not worrying about the rest, I'm just worrying about this. We have a third degree function, so it's going to have three directions, right? It's either going to go up, down, up, or it could go down, up, down. But think about it. If our leading coefficient is positive, doesn't it have to end off going up? So see this one right here? This is not even a possibility. I'm going to erase this. So our function, without doing any sort of work, is going to look like this. So we know... If you think about the end behavior, as x approaches negative infinity, that means as we go to the left, f of x has to also approach negative infinity because it's going down. So this, choice one, is out. Okay, and if I look over here, choice three is also out. As x approaches negative infinity, the y values are not getting bigger. As we go to the left on our graph, the y values are getting smaller. So choice three is out too. Okay, so let's look at choice two. As x approaches negative infinity, as we go to the left, the y values approach negative infinity. The y values go down. That looks good. Now this says as x approaches positive infinity, so as we go to the right on our graph, f of x goes up. And that is true. The y values are going up. So, so far, choice two looks good. But look at this. Choice four says the same thing. The only difference between choice two and choice four is choice two says the graph has three x-intercepts. And choice four says the graph has four x-intercepts. Well, if this is a third degree function, it cannot have more than three x-intercepts. It cannot have four x-intercepts. That's not a possibility. So choice four is out. So choice two is our answer. Okay, now for those of you that were like, wait, that was kind of tricky. You could easily do this in your calculator. Okay, so this is what I did. I just took any number I wanted and replaced it with A. I chose three. Okay, so I typed in my calculator 4x squared times x plus 3, and then instead of minus x minus a, I did minus x minus 3. So you could choose anything. If you don't want 3, you could choose 5, 8, whatever you want. Okay, and then if I hit graph, just look at your graph. There it is. Okay, you could see that on the left, our graph is going down. And on the right, our graph is going up. So it has to be what choice two or choice four is saying is compared to end behavior. And then if we look, we have one, two, three x-intercepts. So choice two would be the answer. Okay, and then the last one in this section with unit two review. They give us a function, v of x, and here we have it. And they say it models the volume in cubic inches of a rectangular solid. And they want us to graph it over the domain from zero to three. So they already set this up for us from zero to three. All right. And so, basically, I mean, if you were to, let me just do this. If we were to set this function equal to zero, okay, we would see that we have zeros at x equals zero. Um, if you had, I mean, I don't know if you see this, but three minus x, if you take three minus x, and set it equal to zero and solve, I would just add x to both sides of the equation, leaving you with x equals three. So right here, this is gonna be x equals three. And then this one we could see is x equals negative four, okay? So 
these would be the zeros of our function, but they don't want us to graph at x equals negative 4. They only want us to do it between 0 and 3. So we know right off the bat we're going to have a 0 at 0 and a 0 at 3. So there's two points on our graph. And basically, to find the other points, you can just go to y equals in your calculator and you can plug this in and just go to your table of values. Okay? Okay, so I went to y equals in my calculator. And I'm just going to go to my table of values, so second graph. And we can see they want us to graph between 0 and 4. So we already found that at 0, the y coordinate is 0. And at 3, the y coordinate is 0. So basically, if we look here, when x is 1, y is 10. So we're going to plot that point. And when x is 2, y is 12. So we're going to plot that point as well. Okay, so let's plot those on our graph. Okay, so I'm going to plot these points. Now, the y-axis isn't numbered for us, but based on how many boxes are here, if we let each box represent one unit, we'll definitely be able to fit up, you know, to a height of 12. We may have to go higher as well. So, okay, let's do this. So I'm going to number every other number. I'm going to put a 2, 4. So I'm just jumping a box and just putting the even numbers just so it's not too tight in there. 12, and I'm going to number a little bit higher in case the graph does wind up going higher than 12. Okay, so we're going to plot a point at 1, 10. And we're also going to plot another point at 2, 12. So that would be right there. Okay, so when we go to connect these, I'm actually assuming the graph is going to go a little higher than 12. To me, it's probably going to look something like this. Okay, let's look at our calculator, though. So let me... um. All right, so if I were to hit graph, um, I'm going to adjust my window just so that it fits, you know, the coordinate plane they give us. So let's hit window, and let's make our x max 0. I'm sorry, our x min 0, and our x max 3, right, because that's our domain they want us to graph between. You could set the x minimum at 0, and we're not exactly sure how high you want to make the x max. So you could pick, I mean, we know it goes above 12. We're not exactly sure how high. You could make it 15, 20, whatever you want. I'm going to hit 15, and when I hit graph, we can see there's our graph. So when you could see when x is 2, right, if that's at a height of 12, the graph actually is going to go above a height of 12. So let's figure out exactly how high that goes. I mean, for right now, we don't have to be exact, but if you were to trace, see those y values? They're going up and up, right? 12.57, 12.59 and so on. So it doesn't look like they are quite reaching 13, but it's getting somewhere close. So we're not gonna, if this is where 13 is, we're gonna come close to it, but not exactly that high. All right, so let's connect this like this. And then we can label that V of X. And there we have it, there's our graph. Okay, and the last part asks us to find to the nearest tenth of a cubic inch what the maximum volume of this rectangular solid would be. So we could see from the graph, and we used the trace function before, we could see it comes above 12 but not quite to 13. So we're going to have to use our calculator to find exactly where that occurs to the nearest tenth of a cubic inch. Okay, so back to our graph, right? It's super easy to do. If we go to second trace, we're going to choose choice four. We're just looking for the maximum. And it says left bound. Now, my cursor actually already is to the left of the maximum, but if your cursor is not, you could just use the arrow key and move it until you're somewhere to the left of this maximum and then hit enter. Okay, now it says right bound. So we're gonna use our right arrow key, see right here? And we're gonna move that to we're clearly to the right of the maximum point. So, I mean, it looks like to me the maximum point's here, so now we're clearly to the right. And then you're gonna hit enter and it says guess, hit enter again, and you can see the maximum height. Remember, height is your y value. How high does it go? Is right here. And they want us to round to the nearest tenth, so it would be 12.6. Okay, so the maximum height is going to be 12.6, and then here's our units, cubic inches. I'm just going to write inches with a little cube like that, and that would be our answer.